We faced a kind of horrendous dilemma that, you know, if we tried to make it up, it wouldn't have seemed, you know, we couldn't have constructed it to be more painful because we realized we were in a position where any choice we made could result in somebody's death. You know, if we did nothing, if it turned out Ted was the Unabomber, he killed again, we would have to go through the rest of our lives with the blood of some innocent person on our hands, realizing that somebody had died because we had failed to act. On the other hand, the, you know, the other horn of this dilemma was to realize that, you know, the Unabomber had committed capital crimes. If I turn Ted in, if he's found to be guilty, there's a chance, maybe even a probability, that one day he would be executed. You know, I thought about what it would be like for me to go through the rest of my life with my own brother's blood on my hands, you know. It was like the ethical contradiction implicit in the death penalty was I was living right through this. Um, you know, I thought about the effect on Ted, the guilt I would carry, but, you know, even more than Ted and, and, and myself, I thought about our mother. At this point, she's a 79-year-old widow, worried for years about Ted because of his mental illness. Uh, but believe me, her worst nightmare didn't come close to what we were struggling with, that Ted was a serial murderer. Um, you know, people will ask me, well, how did you make the decision? And I would point out it really was a couple's decision, it was a family decision. I think ultimately Linda and I felt that we had to take this one step at a time, and we had to do, we had a moral obligation to stop the violence if we could. And then we just had to hope that, you know, they would realize Ted was mentally ill, perhaps they would not seek the death penalty, but we had to save innocent lives first if we could. But I, but I gotta say, you know, the reason my brother didn't get the death penalty wasn't because he was mentally ill. We do execute quite a few mentally ill people in this country, more than 100 by a recent study since 1992. Um, it wasn't because there was any mercy for our having turned Ted in. I've known other families that turned in loved ones only to witness their executions. I'll tell you about one of those stories in a second. Um, his life was saved because he had great attorneys. Um, in general, we're not executing the people in this country who commit the worst crimes. We're executing the people who got the worst legal representation. And I think we all know who those people are. You know, they're pe people with limited economic resources, they're people with, who are mentally challenged, they're often, too often, people of color. You know, the murderer and the executioner both fail to see that the greatest agony is for the surviving family members on both sides. I didn't come out of that whole ordeal thinking, I'm going to spend the rest of my life fighting the death penalty. You know, I was sort of almost glad it was over until a call came from a guy in California. He said his name was Bill Babbitt name I'd never heard. He was, of course, aware of my name. And he told me that I, he thought I was maybe the only person in the country who could understand what he was going through at the moment. And when I heard his story, I realized it was probably true. He had turned in his brother to the Sacramento Police Department. Uh, he had read a newspaper article about an elderly woman whose apartment had been broken into. Someone had savagely beat her and, and walked away with a few I think a watch and some nickels, and um, in reading this news story, he began to suspect his own brother, who had been a Vietnam vet, um, had a piece of shrapnel in his skull from, you know, in his brain, spent three years in a mental institution, so he's turning in his brother to the police and saying, this isn't going to be a death penalty case, is it? Manny, Manny's not a monster, he, he's really been messed up since Vietnam. And the prosecutor says, not a death penalty case, we'll see that, to it that your brother gets the help he needs. It wasn't until he went to his brother's arraignment that he realized it was a death penalty case and that they were going to seek the death penalty against his brother. Um, Bill Babbitt's brother, Manny, got the opposite side of the criminal justice system. My brother had great lawyers. His brother had a court-appointed attorney that had never tried a criminal case before. Um, he got an all-white jury, though he you know, was an African-American family. His brother's lawyer was drunk every day of the trial. Uh, later disbarred. At the end of this whole process, his brother gets sentenced to death. Eighteen years later, he's calling me and saying, you know, my brother's appeals have run out. They're going to execute your brother. And my brother, and he's talking about how he was feeling guilty and suicidal, and I'm saying, Bill, this, you didn't mean any harm to your brother. This isn't your fault. It's the system. Um, and I actually thought, naive as I was, again, I didn't miss the politics of this, but I thought we could save his brother's life. That, you know, in the late 20th century in California, uh, this just couldn't be happening. And then it was like surreal. I, I saw the part of the story that I didn't have to live.
Um, Bill Babbitt was never thanked by the victim's family, was never um, thanked by the prosecutors or the police. His only reward for turning in his brother was to a front row seat at his brother's execution. So he watched his brother be put to death at San Quentin Prison. I attended the funeral, which was at a small town on Cape Cod, about a three-hour drive from Schenectady, New York, where I live. And, um, you know, it was, it was like spring of the year. It was, you know, spring in the Northeast is just like in Montana. It's beautiful. You know, there's, there's flowers and there's birds. And yet here we are in a graveyard and there's a flag-draped coffin. And it was the first time I met Bill's mother, who was about the same age as my mother, maybe a half inch taller than my mother. And there she is, you know, weeping at her son's funeral. And Bill has his arm around her. I can't imagine the guilt he's carrying. And, you know, as I saw that, those two people, I realized, well, that could have easily been me and mom, except for one reason, you know. We were educated. Ted had great lawyers. You know, we, we, uh, we, we were well-spoken because it was such a high-profile case. The media was highlighting our story. You know, we were heroes. All he was was, you know, his brother's blood on his hands. Um, and it was at that point, you know, I really began to feel, you know, people have gen genuinely good hearts. I think that people in America really want to be fair. I think that if they begin to look at the cruelty of the death penalty, at the injustice of the death penalty, it's an eye-opener. They're going to begin thinking about this differently. A couple of years ago, I was at a vigil at the Supreme Court building of the United States. And engraved in white marble on the facade of that building, a beautiful building, are four words. And the words are equal justice under law. I mean, I think it's a noble, profound, defining aspiration for our democracy. But, you know, it's an aspiration. It's not a reality. We're a long way from that. As long as we can put innocent people on death row, as long as, you know, the people selected from four death row are people with, you know, limited ep economic resources from the margins of society, as long as we're willing to spend in New York $200 million on a, on a program that ended up executing nobody, or in California, $250 million per execution and not invest in crime prevention, in law enforcement, and aid for victims, we've got a serious problem. 